Welcome to another Beyond Barriers podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Craig McCann. He is an independent specialist advisor and researcher as director of Spectrum Strategic Preventative Expertise to Counter Terrorism Risks Using Upstream Measures Universal LCD. He provides consultative services for domestic clients and international development programs with an emphasis on preventative counterterrorism strategy and delivery. He also writes, advises, lectures, and provides commentary on the UK Prevent Strategy, de-radicalization, disengagement programming, and online approaches to counterterrorism and response to right-wing ext extremism. Uh, Dr. McCann also holds a law degree and an MA in criminology from the University of Kent at Canterbury. And at the same university, he completed his PhD, which explored how the UK Prevent Strategy has been applied to right-wing extremism since 2011. He also converted this thesis into a book titled The Prevent Strategy and Right-Wing Extremism, a case study of the English Defense League, which has been published as part of the Rutledge Extremism and Democracy Range. Welcome, Craig. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, first, we're going to just kind of jump in here. Um, you had an article recently that uh, was originally published by Carr. Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. Beware the anti-fascists for they have become what they oppose. And this actually created quite the controversy. Um, can you tell us a little bit uh, first, because I don't think a lot of people get to, they might just read an article that somebody has written, but they don't ever get to hear what prompted somebody to write such an article. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the mindset of what you were thinking and why you felt it was important to actually write this article? Yeah, sure. So I suppose um, I, for many years, have been working um, you know, uh, originally in the, the counter-Islamist uh, terrorism space um, and then shifted uh, gears in around 2009-10 to, to look at more, um, you know, more the right wing. Uh, so right wing terrorism and uh, uh, the I suppose the, the the evolution of our strategic approach to counter terrorism has followed that, that it, it's very much gone in that direction. So we're very much focused on Islamist terrorism post 9-11. Uh, when it got to around, you know, to the eight, nine, ten, started to think about all forms of terrorism because there had been an increase in in um, in, in threats. Uh, from from uh, from the right of the spectrum, um, then I suppose over the last um, uh, two or three years, um, I've seen the, the 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 rise of the threats uh, emanating from left wing terrorism. When you look at things like uh, TSAT reporting uh, from across the European Union, you're seeing uh, the, the 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 threats from left wing groups. Uh, start to really hit the headlines, you know, particularly think about places like Italy, Spain and Greece. Uh, so groups that uh, aren't in that street protest uh, uh, um, sphere, they are very much bona fide terrorist organisations committing terrorist acts. And I suppose what prompted me to write the article is the, you know, as much as we thought that we had a blind spot when it came to right-wing terrorism back in 2008-9, um, I think we're very much a blind spot now in, in when we think about left wing terrorism and uh, and what some people will justify um, based upon ideologies that sit within the left. Um, uh, and I found um, myself coming across uh, chatter online. You know, did a little, still a lot of work with um, uh, with act with activists and with uh, intervention providers who work with governments to. Uh, to, to work with individuals who may be vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism. And, you know, there's, the, there's a, a real consensus um, uh, you know, view that um, some of the tactics that are um, creeping into um, groups uh, like Antifa, for instance, um, are emulating those that we saw on the right of the, of the dynamic. You know, uh, and I quoted in the in the article um, uh, the 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 phrase um, uh, it's, it's it's okay or, ju or justification to flatten the nose or to, to brass knuckle up and flatten the nose of a proud boy. And I was, in the article, I was making the case that actually, um, if you're advocating for political violence against those who are your diametric opposition, then maybe you're no better than them. 
uh, you know, in terms of uh, the, the the justification of political violence. Um, and yeah, I, I got a probably fair to say a, a significant backlash, um, particularly from uh, from accounts on Twitter um, uh, in the US. Um, what I would say is that um, the it was very interesting, actually, the level of backlash and, uh, and some of the charges that were made against me. Um, I was framed as, a, as an apologist for right-wing terrorism, but at no point did anyone really, uh, I think, satisfactorily engage with the central argument. And that was um, that actually justification of political violence. Um, what, why should we give those on the left a free pass um, with, with, with regards to what they, they, they justify on the streets? when we condemn it for other, you know, um, uh, uh, extremist groups. Um, so it was a, it was an interesting, it's been an interesting couple of weeks um, uh, in terms of the, the, the response to the article. And uh, unfortunately it's been removed from the, the car, um, the, the, the Center of Analysis of Radical Rights. Um, it's been removed from their website because of the level of pressure they came under. Um, so, and unfortunately, uh, as well, the uh, the director of Car, who is a is a, a you know a tremendous character in this in this um, in this field, you know, um, Professor Matthew Feldman, and uh, he has done more to counter terrorism emanating from the radical right than all of these individuals uh, who are angrily mashing their fingers into their laptops. All of them put together, frankly, um, right. and they. Uh, and I think he really tried to create an atmosphere within a car, which was a broad church. And he understood that we need actors from across all political persuasions to unite in the, 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 the joint end endeavor to counter all forms of political violence. And uh, I suppose it's probably fair to say that I politically sit on the other side of that church. Uh, to a lot of other individuals who are associated with CAR. But I have never had a problem working with people um, and other academics and, uh, and people doing programming on, on, on the ground. Um, as long as obviously we, we know what the, you know, we know what the rules of engagement are. Um, but it's very, it's been very telling over the last couple of weeks how many individuals associated with CAR have, uh, I think, abandoned the idea of broad church. Uh, and have, have have crept into, in my view, becoming apologists for political violence on the left. Um, I'd go so far as to say that in some of the some of the uh, some of the discourse that I've seen over the last couple of weeks. Right. I wanted to I wanted to say I, I thought your article was really fair and it and it covered uh, those issues. And I mean, especially you know, for all the years you've spent tackling the far right. You know, just to point out something like that and to say, hey, we should condemn violence no matter what side it comes from. To me, that's not controversial. That's common sense. And that's why I really I was I was pretty shocked to see the uh, the level of of animosity that came towards towards that statement and towards that article, because I don't feel that. Uh, I don't feel that it was unfair and coming as someone that had been an extremist on the far right, I, I can, I can, uh, I can say that one of the things that a lot of the people on the far right believe is they see the, you know, the far left getting away with certain things. And we monitor, you know, one of the things we do at Beyond Barriers too, is we monitor this chatter, you know, not only do we know these people from when we were there years back, but we also monitor their chatter and you hear things like, well, so what, what happened on January 6th? Because in 2020, the riots and the burnings and the lootings, that was, you know, way worse than what we did. You know, it's, it's always this, this yeah. balance, you know, they say, well, they're just as bad or no, they're worse. And, and I hear that all the time too, you know, it's sort of like, well, Nazism was bad, but communism was worse or communism was worse, you know, or vice versa, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And that's how uh, an extremist balances this stuff. They say, well, it's really not that extreme because these people are getting away with it. So why can't we get away with it? So I felt like it was an article and it was something that needed to be said and not, and, and the fact that there was this backlash over it, over just being fair. You, I don't think I feel, this is just my opinion, but I don't feel like you said anything that was, 
um, over the top or, or wrong or really that controversial. And it shouldn't have been reacted to in that manner, because if we don't look at all forms of extremism and tackle these issues fairly, fair, fair is the, is the key word here, and, and not let our own personal opinions get in the way of that sort of thing, um, you know, it's the problems are going to exasperate. They're going to get worse. And, and that's why I thought it was courageous, uh, e even though you did take flack for it. And, and I'm sure you still are. Um, it it should have been it should have been said and you should have had more support in 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 my opinion on that but I, i'm not yeah. getting into the politics of, of all that or, or anything yeah. like that but i just wanted to say we felt like it was it, it was a a good thing to do because it's fair yeah no, thanks and, and i know and you know that that um twitter is not the real world <laughs> and uh you know the 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 distinct uh, a, a very small echo chamber that is um, the you know, obviously a lot of these accounts that that they you know, did you know, vociferously um, attack me and the article and and also Professor Feldman and and Carl itself for even having the audacity to to to, to publish the article um, that's not representative of of, of normal people uh, absolutely not the the, the um, so then we've got to bear in mind the uh, the, the, the nature of uh, the the well, I suppose the, the backlash um, because actually I've spoken to many practitioners, including um, members of CAR itself, who have um, reached out to me um, uh, by of support over the last couple of weeks and said, "Look, you know, um, don't necessarily want to raise my head above the parapet, but I just want to say I agree with every word you say." Um, and so. I think practitioners working in the space who understand risk, threat, and vulnerability, uh, they they read the piece, um, uh, and actually they know me as well, and they know my record, which I stand by, um, and uh, and they know that all these charges that I'm some kind of fascist, um, they just don't pass the smell test, frankly, you know, and uh, so I, I take. Um, I take solace from that. Um, uh, actually, uh, I've I've put something out there that has at least precipitated a conversation that needs to be had. I suppose the impact that couldn't be foreseen. I mean, you know, you're always going to get some some flack online from people, you know, and some some of the issues that I touched upon in the article um, obviously didn't set sit well with people that are in that space. And actually, in in their response, uh, they have proven my argument. In the fact that you know, uh, actually, all the nastiness that's out there and the justification for violence. When you think about the the rebuttal article that was written by um, uh, a, a guy, you know, obviously still still within car, um, you know, things were said there like you know maybe I'm create I was charged with creating a bit of a straw man, you know, when it comes to Antifa and some of the individuals affiliated with the organisation, and uh, we've got to be really careful about. Um, uh, the, the the nature of some of these groups, movements, organisations, because I've studied um, uh, the, the, the far right for years, and you, you're never a card carrying member of these organisations. You can you can loosely be joined to or have an affiliation with with a brand because you're ideologically um, aligned to them. You can you can you can very much buy into it, but you don't pay a subscription anymore. You are part of a loose network of, of followers. So we've got to be careful about you know banning you know things like uh, you know members of or, or, or adherence to, but um it was I think for me it was very um, very clear that uh, in the charge that I'm creating a bit of a straw man I mean that equally that's uh, I really challenged that because I think even the FBI in the states has moved from you know this. Uh, you know, framing of Antifa as an idea to actually recognising that there are organised um, uh, nodes uh, at the local level, organisers, you know, mobilising people, that this has got a significant online footprint. You know, this is this is going to be, and there is a number of individuals who are, or have been and who are being under investigation uh, for criminal offences dropping out of street protests. So um, I think we've got to take this seriously. I think... Um, I think there are too many um, academics and too many activists and, you know, a very, very blurry line between the two now, nowadays, um, who are not just turning a blind eye to the political violence associated with these groups, movements, organisations, but they're also um, condemning those that highlight it. 
uh, such as myself. So you, you, to have the audacity to, to even you know, raise it as an issue, you get stomped on. Um, or in their view, they just want to yeah. silence you. They want to censor any kind of conversation that, uh, that is uh, uncomfortable for them. Um, but so as, as much as I say that you know, we could have anticipated a bit of a backlash online, I think the thing that was surprising was the response within CAR. Um, because uh, there were fellows that resigned over this, and then 27 of them um, got together and wrote uh, an open letter um, calling for me to be um, kicked out of the of the of the um, research centre, um, questioning the, um, the leadership, and wanting to. I mean, if you read what the so the, the kind of list of demands, I mean, that should chill any researcher to the core. You know, it was very much a, an ideological takeover. Um, we want to appoint our own committees to to talk, you know, to to you know, sign off on members. We want to uh, take over the editorial process so that all of the insights coming out from from fellows, we we, we want to say as to what goes out. You know, that that's that you know, that is censorship every day of the week. Um, you know, so there's very much a group think that I didn't realise. That, that's there um, and um, and obviously in response to that obviously Professor Feldman resigned as the as the founder and um, director of CAR and there's a, an acting director there now and they there I think there's an announcement coming up this week where they're going to define the future of the organization but um but I think it's very dangerous that an organization like that with the reputation it had has been subject to such an ideological takeover because where do you think it is that governments and police forces and uh, you know academic institutions? Where do you think they go to understand uh, extremism? They go to groups like CAR, and if CAR is very much ideologically driven towards you know um, turning that blind eye to political violence of the left, then they are no longer credible. They they can they no longer have a say, and they can no longer be trusted to. Uh, to to speak uh, without fear of favour, to have credibility from a research perspective, to to, to actually influence the conversation we need to have. Um, so that's I suppose over the last couple of weeks, that's the thing that's really I suppose surprised many people. Uh, is the is, is that shift within car itself? But what I would say is um, it's been I've been heartened by the fact that so many people within car have reached out and and uh, you know they they applaud the article, very supportive. Um, but then are very concerned about the future direction. And I want to just say this in, in just general terms, because I, I don't I don't have a, a, a foot in car or, or anything like that. But I want to say, like, from the work that we do at Beyond Barriers, we feel like it's incredibly important to be nonpartisan when you're doing this kind of work, mm -hmm. when you when you're working in prevent or you're working in de-radicalization in the de-radicalization space, period. You have got to be nonpartisan. Of course, everybody has their own political beliefs. You can be right. You can be left. It doesn't matter. Um, but don't be on the extremes. But um, when one of the things that that I noticed right away um, getting out of the movement is that the people that we are helping that to, to leave, the people that we're walking out, they'll ask, you know, like, hey, are you on are you with Antifa? Are you a communist? I mean, this is like the most common question they ask. They literally one after another that's reached out, they ask that. And I say, look, do you see anything in our online footprints, anything that we're putting out that would lead you to believe that? No, but I know other formers or other people do that. So we're at, you know, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to say, no, we're nonpartisan. We'd stay away from that. And I think you have to be and, and again, this is just my opinion. We, we're new on, in, on this side of things, but we know from living that life as extremists how these people think. And for research organizations, and I'm not, I'm not naming anybody because I'm, I'm not going to do that, you know, but um, if a research organization is picking sides in this and going, you know what, I'm, you know, it's going to be ideological this way, you've already lost half the battle. You're not going to get people... People aren't going to change. You've created your own echo chamber now that's that's politically based. And the people that are trying, you know, that are trying to change, they're like, OK, so I have one choice to say it. Stay on this extreme here on the far right or go to this extreme on the far left. And neither one should, is a good choice. You need to be somewhere in the middle. You can be right. You can be left. You can be in the middle, be anywhere else, but stay away from those extremes. 
And the way they're, they're viewing that when people are making these kind of ultimatums or when even criticizing, even pointing out that, hey, there's issues over here. There, it's not just one side. And I, and I do, I've, I've given uh, talks with, with the government and different things like that too. And I've seen other, and, and again, I won't say, you know, who or anything like that, but I've seen other so-called experts talking about there's no extremism on the left. I, I saw a guy say that, that was one of the, the leading experts say they're the only form of left-wing extremism I could find, he said, is going back into the 1960s. I about fell out of my chair. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Of course, there's a lot more going on on the far right, and that should be focused on, um, obviously. But when you, if you can't point out the extremism on the other side, there's something. There's some kind of disconnect. There's something. Uh, I, I think it's 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 an utter failure, and I, I think it's it's shameful, and I think it sets us back in the work that we're trying to do in de-radicalization in general because it, it builds those echo, cha echo chambers. So, uh, sorry for the rant, but it leads me to my next question for you, Craig. Um, Dialogue and civil discourse um, in in your work in prevent in your in your time in in uh, the law enforcement and everything else. Um, do you think that uh, dialogue and civil discourse are important things that we should have in in society today, or do you think it's better to uh, use cancel culture and and cancel thoughts and opinions? I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. <laughs> well, I think I think. I think this is this is why there is so much um, concern and pushback against cancel culture and um, and I mean, you, you hear the term woke a lot, don't you? You know what what is woke? Woke is being you know alive to the idea that there is prejudice out there and try to you know trying to overcome that, you know trying to combat that as much as possible. And so I, I kind of prefer to, um, to, to 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 work from the basis that everyone is woke. We're all you know in terms of our level of awareness, our level of um, you know, the level of information that we've now got access to, the networks. Um, I think we're all, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, humanity in the year 2022, I think there's never been a better time, you know, to, to be, uh, you know, living uh, in, in our societies. The number of, uh, you know, laws that we have, uh, the, the kind of cultural awakening that we've had um, in terms of uh, equality and, you um, I think there's a lot of people that would decry that and say, well, you know, I would pr prefer to focus on the past than, than, than the present and the future. And I think um, there is a very pernicious, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think way of thinking that it's, got, it's, it's taken hold particularly within, within social media. And let's not forget that social media um, uh, encourages this just because it's... Um, the way that this stuff is built is about relevance and it's uh, it, it kind of um if, if you have a particular way of thinking it's very easy to fall into a tribe on social media and i've said this time and time again social media didn't make people bad but it brought the bad out in people because of the way that that we that we use this stuff so i think um uh the 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 term woke has been has been hijacked in many ways by people very much who are extreme in their thinking um when you think about cancel culture i mean this has been applied many many times um you know and there's been almost a a, a, a denial that it exists which clearly doesn't it clearly does exist i mean it's 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 many many high profile instances of this and um, what i would say is from a kind of counterterrorism perspective some of the the language used to to quell dissent and to uh to, to remove people's voices if we were talking about the right we'd be using phra phraseology like dehumanization we'd be talking about us and them thinking we'd be talking about i mean these are the the kind of factors that we look at in the in the disengagement space you know for for intervention for providers to work with individuals who may be vulnerable to going down these paths um dehumanization is up there you know referring to people who are in opposition to you as as rats um and things like that we, we've seen plenty of instances of that now what's the difference between that and justifying going out and flattening someone's nose you know, you are justifying violence against a human being because you no longer see them as a human being. 
uh, it's very much us and them. So um, I think we we there is this this um, you know uh, it's cancel culture. It's this uh, uh, say very pernicious strand of thinking within our discourse at the moment where um, it's very easy to drop into those echo chambers online sometimes. I mean, I left Twitter about Christmas time and I've got to say, I've never felt so good because it's very easy to get drawn into this very negative spiral, spiraling way of thinking um, that, that there is rampant inequality out there, that there, you know, we, we, we're going backwards in many ways. Well, actually, I think we need to champion a lot of the successes that we've got. And oftentimes it's people speaking on behalf of minority communities rather than minority communities talking on their own behalf. And I think sometimes their voice gets crowded out by the more militant lobbies who actually have very big profiles on social media and use it um, uh, to, to gather, you know, uh, to get their views out there and to cause division. Um, so, so I think there is, um, I mean, it's a fascinating um, uh, study in of itself, just how, how some of these echo chambers influence the broader discourse, because people do, you know, you look at news headlines now, and they're taking snapshots off Twitter. Um, why are we allowing sometimes the kind of lowest common denominator in the thinking, you know, these are not expert opinions, these are random people on, on Twitter, where we're, we're elevating them to a status that they simply um, don't deserve. These are not experts. These are not people that have gone out there and walked the walk. And yet, because they, they title themselves activist or anti-fascist even, they, are, they have an elevated sense of their own status in the discourse. Uh, and I tend to find it's very, very negative. Um, it's very divisive, not helpful at all to actual practitioners such as ourselves who are actually trying to go out there and bridge divides. I mean, I've, I've sat with community groups um, for, for years um, within the police service, outside the police service, um, facilitated conversations to, to talk about the local tensions, um, having some difficult conversations and going to places where sometimes people fear to tread. And actually, that's the only way that you're going to start bridging these divides. Um, you won't do that through cancel culture and, and having a safe space. Sometimes the, the, most, the most needed conversations need to take place in unsafe spaces. Uh, you need to have the courage to go there and actually talk to people about things like the changing, the changing um, demographics in a local town. You know, that's a, in some, some, some places, that's, that's, that's a real issue. Um, we had um, big problems, obviously, uh, lots of, um, uh, of divisiveness around our Brexit vote. You know, we didn't have, in the wake of that, a really concerted, proactive effort to go out into communities to, to, to actually have the difficult conversations, you know, because it's just easier to shy away from it and allow, what we do is we, we cede ground to the extremes. Uh, and the extremes that have a very big voice on, or, or an elevated platform on social media. And that's, that's a big danger for us as practitioners, because, you know, we go back to, to, to those labeling themselves anti-fascists uh, who, uh, so, so, you know, this, this, you know, this huge backlash against the, the article, um, they're not helping at all. They're getting in the way of actual practitioners. Um, and, you know, cynically, I made, I, I nodded to this as well. They often, um, like to be um, the, the arsonist and the firefighter. So to, to go in and stir the pot and create a lot of division and then come up with the, the solutions to it. Um, so there's, a, there's very much a, a, a self-interest uh, play here for many of the actors that you see in this space. Absolutely. Now, uh, one question I also had is being that you're in the UK and we're in the US and I never realized it as much until I left the far right and started looking at other places other than the U.S. and how it's the same but differs the problems that we see with the right wing extremism and the left wing extremism. Now, being that you're in the U.K., have you seen or maybe did you get more of a backlash from the left here in the U.S. than you did in the U.K.? or? Oh, How yeah. did that kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, very much led from the US. 
Um, and that's the, you know, when you think about the, the, these networks, that's, that's, that's where it exists. Um, I think culturally we, in terms of the conversation around counter-terrorism and counter-extremism and the, 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 the framing CVE, which I, <laughs> I've written about this before, See, CVE um, is an aberration in many ways of, 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 of counter-terrorism work and, uh, and you know, good old-fashioned uh, community cohesion work. Um, but that's probably a conversation for another day. But I think um, I think the, uh, the 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 main you know, the, the most significant backlash was from from the US. But I think um, culturally, we when we think about when we talk, have these, these these conversations about C, CT, for instance, we very much take the lead from the states on this. So there is, um, you know, we you know. You know, think think back to kind of the, the war on terrorism, and then obviously latterly, uh, you know, certainly over the last uh, ten or so years, the the shifts towards right wing terrorism, very much led by the by by the US. I mean, we we very much follow, um, and there are many of us that would say that we need to be taking taking more of a lead. I mean, I'd, I'd say that our prevents approach is um, better in the UK than it is in the US. Um, I think there is um, uh, there's a whole multitude of reasons for that. I think we, we made a lot of mistakes on, on the way. Don't get me wrong. We we kind of we stepped in a, a whole bunch of potholes um, in the development of that. But I'd, I'd go so far as to say that our prevent strand within our counterterrorism strategy is world leading right now. And I do a lot of work in international development. I, I do very much believe that. Um, I think the the investments uh, and the thought leadership on, on on that has been has been second to none. Um, but I think in terms of the cultural um, uh, leading the conversation um, uh, on, on things like political correctness, cancel culture, um, uh, these are things that we are inheriting from you know, our Amer American brothers and sisters, unfortunately. And we saw, we saw this cancel culture, it took root in American universities first. And there are a lot of people here that say it never happened over here. Well, it has happened over here. You know, we 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 very much. I mean, it started with yourselves, and we we very much imported it, and it's now permeated into our media. Um, you know, our broader kind of academic circles, and there is a I think a concerted pushback against that. Um, uh, there was a study I read um, that suggested that you know based upon um it was survey data with academics um in, in you know from a, from a whole range of different universities that those uh, academics that would define themselves as maybe sitting on the right of the spectrum so center right in their in their leaning um definitely felt more of the chill of cancel cancel culture than the left but in, but significantly many academics on the left also felt it um, so it's not something we can deny the existence of um, it's been very interesting seeing how this has shifted over time and that uh, there was, I think, some probably self-assured people uh, over here that would say, you know, it's, that, that's happened in the States. It will never happen here. Well, 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 it has. You know, we, we have very much imported that. Where this goes next, who knows? You know, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Um, but I, I do see there's a very much a kind of cultural clash going on. Um, and for me, one of the best things people can do is take get themselves off social media um and i think uh, <laughs> it's, uh it's uh, it can be a very very positive thing but i think at the moment it's it's toxic um and it's uh, very much if you're going there pick a tribe and if you don't want to pick a tribe you're going to be left on the sidelines um and uh, that's a very dangerous place to be we know we know that all too well, you know, being neutral on things. And I, I've, I've said it a million times, like I never thought like being in the middle and being neutral on this stuff and, and being, you know, non, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of the word now, but nonpartisan, nonpartisan would be a controversial thing. Like yeah. being neutral is, is yeah. and I think radi radicalization, just from my experience and from our experience, is reciprocal. Like if you have radicalization on one side, you're going to have it on the other. And if you just, if you look at, look at it through a lens and just say, it's just this one side, you only have half the picture. You can't, you yeah. can't balance it because a lot of times it's reciprocal. And, and I've got examples of that from the time in the movement when there was, when there was clashes, 
you know, it radicalized people. It got people more pumped up to go to things and, and things like that. When, when there was, uh, you know, like the old saying goes, if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, you know, does it make a sound? Yeah. You know, at, at those yeah. events where there was no, uh, no counter demonstrators, nobody to fight with, it was, it was demoralizing for the people mm -hmm. on the far right to, to be there. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah. from my perspective in the past as, as a leader, I worried at that point, like, wow, are we going to have people showing up at the next rally? So, I mean, that should be telling. That should be yeah. something that people go, wait a minute. Hmm. So, you know, I'm not saying that necessarily, I don't have all the answers and I'm not saying that people should ignore it either, but um, I am saying that when there's violence, that tends to spike things up. That tends to push people back into those echo chambers that they're already in and, and things like that. But I'm glad you mentioned the prevent strategy there in the, in the UK. And, and uh, I've heard it's, it's very good over there. And um, I'm just curious about a little bit about that. And I have some questions. Something came up and I just wrote this one down. But uh, someone was talking about mentoring and prevent, and how important do you feel that is? I think that's a good question. Yeah, sure. So um, I think within within our prevention, we have the, what we call the channel program. So this is uh, it's it's uh, very, you hear the term whole of government, whole of society approach. Uh, well, this is where the ties hit the tarmac uh, very much. In that, if an individual is identified um, as as having certain vulnerabilities, certain needs, and they're, they're maybe being drawn into terrorism. So they're being targeted by a group. Uh, they may be coming out with narratives uh, at school or in their workplace. Um, there's a, a mechanism whereby they can be referred to, initially their, their, their might be their employer or their school, their college. Um, a lot of people have now been trained in, you know, in, in, in um, making referrals to prevent and have a much better understanding of some of the factors at play here. But then ultimately, after many checks and balances to uh, you know, deconflict the information, to, to, to find out if it's actually um, uh, bona fide, if it's, if it's mischievous or if there's actually something to it, um, ultimately the um, individual can be offered to take part in an intervention. That was a consent based program. So, and I personally have been to people's home addresses and sat down with them and their mums and their dads and said, look, you know, based upon your conduct, um, at school, for instance, um, you've come up with the following comments. Um, we would like to introduce you to an individual who is um, maybe a former extremist themselves, uh, maybe a, a, a mentor within you know, a local community group um, to have some conversations, you know, to, to, to see where it goes, you know, to maybe broaden your horizons, you know. Um, and what we, we tend to find is it's very ironic, actually, because one of the... Um, one of the charges laid at the door of Prevent was that it chills debate, chills conversation. That was never my experience of it. Because what we tended to find is that the individuals who were in this space between kind of, you know, racism and, um, uh, you know, you know poor, poorly integrated, perhaps, and terrorism. So these are the people that were sitting in this space that were vulnerable and maybe on the periphery of going into terrorism. Now, they had had their minds closed to um, alternatives. So one of the big things that that recruiters do is they they drive wedges between the individual and forms of information because they want to be the only form of information or the only the means of getting information for the person. So they'll they'll drive wedges between the um, uh, the, the person and their friends and family. Um, they'll discredit, um, um, you know, might be um, the, 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 their government, their police service, and it's all about trying to whittle away alternative perspectives. So my experience of channel is that oftentimes through conversations, we would um, get people to think a bit more critically about what they've been told, you know, to, and I never found it as restrictive, it was more liberating. You know, so we'd, we'd encourage them to read, um, you know, read these, read these books, go and, go and uh, you know, expand your horizons, speak to these people. Um, and what we tended to find is that in breaking down the walls of that echo chamber, we could actually liberate them from, from very dangerous ways of thinking about things and justifying violence and going back to things like dehumanizing people. Uh, you know, so we do things like, well, you know, if you're on the far right, let's get you to, to meet a Muslim. You know, you've never, you know, let's get you down to local, and we'd, we'd, we'd work with community groups who'd facilitate this. And, you know, and you'd, 
you'd sit two guys together and they'd be on completely opposite sides of the spectrum, but they'd find out that they support the same football team, you know, and they can, you know, talking about shooting the breeze and talking about some of the commonalities about the estates they grew up on and, you know, and they know they're kind of the same people. And that's what this is all about. And this is the, you know, as I say, the non-safe spaces we have to work in. Um, but Channel is, um, it's a, it's a multi-agency approach to the problem. You know, it's, it's very much, you know, so police working with health and education partners, uh, NGOs, and bringing all of those perspectives to bear on coming up with the best intervention for an individual. Um, some of the best work I've done with, is within Channel, and I, I very much um, uh, work in that space internationally now, because I've, I've not seen an approach that, that is better uh, at managing some of the risks associated with these individuals um, and trying to trying to meet some you know and meet their needs to divert them away from those pathways uh, to harm. But um, but yeah, that's the it's, it's a distinct irony for me when you have people badging themselves as activists and they're they're uh, I think I go back to it was a it was a it was something that Barack Obama said years ago and he he said uh, if you think that calling people out on Twitter is activism that's not activism. Activism is actually, you know, walking the streets and meeting people and, you know, getting involved in conversations and local issues. Um, this call out culture that people are now badging up as, as, as activism is, um, is, is, is not helping anyone. It's, it's actually, it's actually uh, creating more division. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, that's, uh, that, that my experience of channel is, is um, very positive and certainly I had I had um, a guy that I was managing within Channel. Um, he was very much um, being groomed for a leadership position within the far right in the UK, um, and we 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 managed to divert him away. And we got him. Some of, some of this is about just keeping people busy, you know, giving them something to do so they don't have to hang around the group, you know. And for him, it was getting him into employment. Um, so we got him onto a bricklaying course. He then found a new social group. Um, positive influences, you know, protective factors were introduced. I mean, he met, then met a girl um, and good luck to him. He got on with the rest of his life. And really because we supported him so, so much during those months, he wrote a letter to me um, uh, at the end and said, I'd, you know, thank you for all you've done for me, you know, because I was going down a dangerous path. Can I please stay on channel? You know, because it's, it's such a positive thing for me, but I mean, we can't, keep people on the program you know so they've got to they've got to go off and stand their own two feet at one point but um but yeah i think that was a it was a it was a it just demonstrates the value of that level of emphasis and investment in in individuals absolutely i agree 100 percent. that's amazing and it's true and like you mentioned you know sometimes it's just a matter of keeping somebody busy and being able to provide them opportunities that way they're able to see that there is something other than this echo chamber that they're surrounded yeah. with. I know in my own journey, part of the reason that I got so involved so fast is because I did have extra time on my hands and mm -hmm. I did social media and video and podcasts and suddenly my skills are being appreciated and they're being mm -hmm. used, not in the correct manner, but and it created a doorway and it was a very fast and slippery slope. So I, I agree with that. And like you, you know, it's exactly right. You know, creating an echo chamber so that they can't hear any other opinions. Um, mm -hmm. I know Jeff has said this before about how, you know, going, in, you have to be open-minded to a certain degree to go in. But once you're in, you become very close-minded. Yeah to anything. Yeah. And so part of the way out is becoming open-minded again to other things. And you said it perfectly, like with that program, that's really, really awesome. The channel program, because it, it's giving people a chance and it's, pre it's preventative, mm -hmm. you know, over here in the U S I think we're so enveloped in countering this, that we forget the most important thing is learning how to prevent it from happening in the first place you know that's one thing at beyond barriers like i'm very passionate about getting into the schools and working with the kids and mm -hmm. you know teaching the relational dialogue and the civil discourse because there's going to be people that you don't get along with that you don't agree with that you know 
politically are on opposite ends of the spectrum, but you have to be able to learn how to not look at it at them as the enemy and as the other and not othering, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. And if we can teach that at a very young age, it's a lot easier to prevent than it is yeah. to counter because yeah. once they're already down that path, it's a whole lot harder to grab them and bring them back out. So yeah, yeah. I think there's 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 been a lot of emphasis, and you see this, you know, critical thinking programs in schools to to do just that. I don't think there's nearly enough investment in that, but I do think sometimes it's um it it is it, it's it's, it's closing the stable door after the horse has bolted in many ways. And what do I mean by that? Well, actually, a lot of children's behavior is learned behavior from their parents. And our generation have, have you know, grown, it's exploded over the last few years, you know, the, 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 the crutch of social media, you know, so we have really been drawn into this space. And now you're starting to see, um, it was a great program, The Social Dilemma, I saw on Netflix not too long ago, about how all of this stuff is is altering our brain chemistry in not great ways, in that we are chasing likes and therefore having to be more controversial. And you, 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 you're seeing adults, and um, they're, 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 they're going down these dark alleys and, and manifesting these behaviours. And who, you know, who's in the room you know, learning from this? They're kids. You know, so... As much as we focus our energies on children, I think there's certainly what some work to do on digital literacy, on critical thinking for adults, because That's it's good. so, I mean, I've seen very credible people that I, that I know, and they've been drawn into spats on Twitter, and you think, just put your phone down. It's just, yeah. this is not real life. <laughs> as I say, if you were to go onto Twitter, you'd probably, you'd feel so depressed at the general state of things, uh, uh, because you think there's rampant um uh inequality out there and that there's doom and gloom and there's nothing you can do about it and particularly if you're a, a white heterosexual man um you know the way that you that, that you're framed in terms of your your influence on this and the say that you have within these conversations um i've i've you know i speak to a lot of intervention providers who are working in this space and they said that it's so damaging um to some of the clients that we're working with because they they feel as if they've been portrayed as the enemy and they're the other and they're, they're no longer human. They don't have a say on their lives anymore um, because of what they are, as opposed to who they are and what they do. Um, so, yeah, I, I, my, my, you know, my big message to a lot of people is to, is to focus very much on the, you know, put your phone down and go and go and spend some time with friends and family and just get away from the, the, the stuff because that's, uh, you'll find uh, a lot more, the world is a lot more positive <laughs> than yes. than social media would have you believe uh and actually um uh we are nowhere near as divided uh as 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 is portrayed online um you know you walk down you, you strike up a conversation with a stranger and uh you know generally you know after many years of being in the police service i do believe very much in the power of people to be you know the, the goodness in people and i've seen it don't get me wrong i've seen the bad but I think overwhelmingly it seemed the good. But this recent experience of this backlash, I'm, I, I think I, I'm in a position where, you know, within within my career where I, I know this what it is actually, um, and uh, and I know just how unrepresentative uh, what are, you know, these these views that you see over the last couple of weeks, how how unrepresentative that actually is of normal people, um, and I take great solace in that. <laughs> yes. So could you tell us a little bit about the book that you wrote and, and if people are interested where they could where they could get that? Yeah, sure. So um so I was really keen to look at um uh the how we apply prevent to um right wing extremism in the UK. Um and really the the, the biggest gig in town when it comes to 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 to, to you know, right wing extremism at the time from about two thousand nine onwards was the English Defence League. Um, and what I found um, through, I did a lot of interviews with practitioners, about eight, eight or so interviews up and down the country. I looked at three case study areas. Um, and I actually started the, the, the PhD while I was um, a serving police officer. So I was a head of strategy and policy within Prevent Policing. And I you know, had pretty good networks. Um, and, and actually I found on speaking to people that 
there was this general consensus that the kind of um, that, that one the EDL had never posed a terrorist threat. They were not a terrorist organisation. They they've been sent in plenty of um, uh, 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 um, uh, attempts to prescribe them as a terrorist organisation, but it just never they never hit that criteria. They were the, you know the victims of terrorist attacks, but never never you know, you know causing terrorism themselves. So they were very much a street protest movement. Um, and what I found was that, okay, they'd, they'd never posed a terrorist threat, but they certainly had posed a community cohesion threat. Anytime they turned up, they stirred up tensions locally. Um, that can't be denied at all. I mean, that, that, that was in many ways they're, they're the, the biggest threat they ever posed. And you saw this, you know, when you had the EDL announced they were coming to a particular town, you just saw the opening of old, old wounds you know, it's exposed it to, to, to the world because obviously the national media would come down and they'd start looking at what's going on here, what surface tensions are bubbling. So it really exposed a lot of that. So yes, a community cohesion threat and also a public order threat because they turn up in thousands, you know, numbers would turn up and they'd, uh, you'd have um, uh, um, the, the, the police would shut down the town and say you know, business is closed because obviously the, the uh, you know the huge numbers of people coming in, the, the high prospect of fights on the streets and then what you found is this mobilization of counter protesters then you started to see a lot of a lot of you know fights in the streets criminal damage um so one of the central conclusions from from the book is that that the whereas we focused on the counter-terrorism space very much the poor cousin when we think about policy, it's the, 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 the poor cousin in, in, when we think about policy development is very much in our uh, community cohesion integration space. And when it's very easy to kind of erode that first step on the journey. Um, so you don't focus enough time and effort and energy in building strong communities, but you focus on extremism and terrorism. Well, you need to come back from that. You know, it's, uh, you hear practitioners talking about the upstream space. Well, there is no more upstream space than the way that we build relationships that has nothing to do with terrorism you know and i see this um I see one of one of the uh, whereas we've got a world leading counter terrorism strategy um look across at our community integration strategy and that's where we certainly need a lot of work we need uh, we need a huge amount of emphasis on that because we can actually get in front of a lot of issues um, when we think about prevent um this is the this is pre prevent prevent you know this is where we need to be to stop people even encroaching into into um, this this sphere that we call counter-terrorism so um yeah one of my central conclusions was was just that that actually we are uh, at risk of overly securitizing this sector um, much as we did with this misterrorism in many ways so we learned mistakes from the past or we just you know um just you know, repeating them um so very much uh, pointing towards um, community integration as being the as being the area of the most need, um, and I'd, I'd say in all my international development work, I've I, I've I've drawn the same conclusion from a lot of jurisdictions, and you see the you see the prevailing wisdom of counter extremism, counter terrorism coming in. Well, actually, you need to take a beat and think about what is it you need to get in place first before you even think about counter terrorism. Excellent. So, um, where could someone get the book if they want to get it? Oh, sure. So, um, so it's on the it's it's, it's published through the Routledge um, Extremism and Democracy range. Um, okay. So, yeah. Excellent. I'll make sure to put a link for that in the description below in the video. Great. So, no, thank you. Absolutely, definitely. And did you have any other questions, Jeff? Because no, I think we're at about an hour. Or so I was going to just yeah. ask you that. <laughs> We're almost out of time, but I definitely would love to have you back on for another conversation. There's so much that, you know, we can learn and, you know, you're very knowledgeable about what you do because not only, you know, have you researched it, but you've been in the thick of it and you've, you know, from all angles. So I thank you very much and thank you for having the courage to, you know, speak the truth and knowing that you're going to get flack you know from all sides because you know sometimes when you try to point out the wrongs on each side nobody really likes it yeah. but yeah. i really appreciate it and i just wanted to end with uh actually 
the last line of your article because I think it can be applied in so many different areas of people's life, not just an extremism. But what you said is that to those who advocate for violence against those you oppose, take a good look in the mirror for you may have become that which you hate. And this can go for anybody, whether it's politics, society, everything, you know, you might have a righteous cause, but make sure that you're not using the tactics of those that you oppose because you will become that which you yeah. oppose. So yeah. thank you again. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. No, thank you very much indeed for having me. It's been great talking to you.